morning. I, uh, I, I may not be as sparkling as usually. I, my body is here. My brain is still somewhere, you know, traveling from New Zealand. So if I stumble over a few words, please. Uh, um, my apologies. Um, I'm not sure what happened to, to make me the old man of the uh, field. And, you know, <laughs> I suspect by, uh, by default, uh, everybody else stepped aside or, or worse. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm going to remonstrate somewhat with the uh, community. Before that, though, I was pleasantly surprised on, on Thursday I was attempting to sit in one of my favorite places on the uh, planet, on the Spanish steps. You can't sit in the Spanish steps anymore, but having been uh, whistled at by the police lady and told to move on, I, uh, looked, I saw the lady next to me had a newspaper, which had the uh, headline, Fusion F. Red, and it looked fantastic, amazing. We finally had the recognition that we uh, deserve. Uh, so I, um, invested a very large sum of uh, 1.5 euros and bought the one and only copy of La Republica that I will ever buy. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting peacefully over a bottle of red wine, I transliterated this painfully, word by word, to find out. It was uh, another kind of fusion. Ah, <laughs> that's why. To find out what it's about. It's clearly, it's not about us, but ah. Uh, the, the uh, sub-editor that chose that headline had a, a high degree of freedom as to what uh, headline they put up. So I, I can't help but believe that this was intended as a positive uh, jolt to the cold fusion uh, community. This, that is what I uh, choose to believe. A field faces two major problems that are, that are significantly impeding our uh, progress. Uh, well, the first pro uh, problem is old age, um, and I don't need to explain to this uh, uh, group that, you know, that that really is a problem. I've put this wall of um, you know, retired heroes up to remind me of two things, however. There are worse things than old age. <laughs> And every one of these uh, gentlemen on this uh, wall here, Bacchus, Case, Fleischmann, Ariani, uh, Torbett, uh, Chauvin, and uh, Arata, produced their, their genius level ideas at an age greater than the age that I'm presently at. So there is, there is hope for me. <laughs> but old age brings with it some concomitant uh, consequences, which I'm becoming increasingly familiar with. There's a shortage of uh, fresh ideas, a tendency to uh, repetitive actions. And I watched some research groups that I was very close to simply fall into the trap of doing the same thing over and over uh, and over again. It's also a failure to act. I see, I see Microsoft has done its little thing and, 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 and put a face where it shouldn't be. But um, th there are a number of things, and I'm talking about me now. There are a number of things that I thought to do, experiments that I wanted to perform, that I never got around to performing. You know, other metals, alloys, uh, higher temperatures. And it, is essentially pointless to produce heat at 30 degrees centigrade. We did almost all of our experiments at 30 degrees centigrade. There's no market for heat at 30 degrees centigrade. 300 degrees would be a very, very reasonable number. In fact, probably the optimal. <coughs> but very, very few experiments have been performed in that uh, temperature regime. Other electrochemical modes, you know, I'm an electrochemist, uh, Fleischmann was an electrochemist. Martin Fleischmann, in fact, invented the electrochemical fluidized bed. Fluidized bed of uh, palladium particles or alloy particles um, would be a highly plausible system in which to generate 
excess heat. Mutton actually had an experiment which he set up. Mel Miles ran it once in, um, in Japan. And nobody else has uh, touched it since. I worked on this. Is the, the topic of my postdoctoral work in Southampton was uh, electrochemical fluidized beds and packed beds. I understand the systems very well. I understand their power and relevance to this field. And I've yet never done uh, such an experiment. In old age, we also tend to fail in adoption of modern methods, and we, we clearly need to enlist young people to you know, help us as we, as we daughter along. The second problem we have, and, and, and this, is, this is a strong and serious comment, we communicate poorly. We communicate poorly inside the communicate uh, in the community, and much, much worse, we communicate poorly outside the community, as the recent uh, Google exercise evidences. Oops, wrong way. <coughs> so I would some power the gifty gears to see ourselves as either see us, it would from money up under free us and foolish notion. Robert Burns on seeing a louse in a lady's bonnet. We need to see ourselves as others see us. We, uh, we, we, this community is quite closed. We all know each other. We, we, we communicate with the sort of an inside jargon. But this room is filled with wonderful people, people who have done uh, wonderful things. But the, the people that matter, the people that we need to communicate to, are outside of this room. So we should really think about how we communicate our successes outside this community. Thinking of the, of the recent uh, Google exercise, and I'm going to uh, point to a representative of that exercise in the front here. Our field was recently joined by a new group of people, able and intelligent uh, people. I, I knew essentially all of them, very well motivated, hands picked from relevant uh, disciplines, selected from good institutions, institutions at you know almost the highest level, if you choose from the very highest level in academic ego becomes a, a problem, so we really want the next tier and to do actual work. <laughs> These people are young, with fresh ideas, young enough to be uncontaminated by the stigma that was very effectively opposed in 1989 and 1990. My, my view is that any scientist under 45 you can communicate to. The scientists that were active and lived through the drama of uh, the Fleshman Pond's uh, announcement, March 23rd, 1989, their opinions are rigid. Very, very few of them can be persuaded, and I don't even try. The effort was well planned, well guided, well backed. And, and, and funded with essentially unlimited money. I mean, the, the problem, the biggest problem that Google faces, they make $2.2 billion of profit every month. The disposing of that money wisely is, is obviously a headache, not, not, one, not one I've ever uh, had to deal with, but it's clearly a headache. And it's a strategic effort, strategically planned and ongoing. So the Google Mirror, what happened? What, 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 what should we see reflected in the Google Mirror? Uh, revis revisiting the case of uh, Cold Fusion, and one of the authors of this paper is sitting in the front row, or second row here. <coughs> what the Google team wrote, something like 12 uh, publications, and what was written about them, another dozen or so uh, publications is highly, reflect, highly reflective of how the well-disposed fraction of the outside community sees us. People that are not well-disposed, people that are still 
contaminated by the drama of the drama of 1989. Like, there's, no, there's no interest in communicating with those people. The well-disposed people are telling us how they see us, what they have learned from us, and it would be very uh, foolish to avoid learning the lesson, to see ourselves as others see us. The Google, I, I was part of the activity in 2015. I can assure you that the Google team did not not listen. They listened, they listened keenly. What happened is we did not effectively communicate. And I'm gonna name names or point fingers, but the, the, the effort was a genuine attempt to learn, and we didn't effectively communicate. It's not their fault, it's our fault. In 1920, <laughs> at ICC of 21 in Port Collins, I, I said the words in blue and, and, and annoyed some people and, and some people that are in, in this room today. But I very much believe it, and I'll restate it today perhaps more uh, precisely. This field lacks a clearly and fully specified written protocol to reproduce even semi-reliably, and I would ex accept half the time, any aspect of our claims for cold fusion or condensed matter nuclear effects of any sort. We do not have a piece of paper which can be taken away and followed and if followed by one of normal uh, skill in the art, would, would produce the result, a nuclear effect, tritium, helium-3, helium-4 in non-natural ratios, excess heat at the you know, watt level for hours, something that is clear and unmistakable. We don't have such a procedure. If we did have such a procedure, we would be vastly ahead of where we presently are. We would. We would not have, the problem we would have would be quite different. It's just the fact that we do not have such a procedure, cannot make a procedure available to others, such as the team that uh, Matt uh, Trevithick put together at Google. If we give them a procedure that they would follow, they would run with it. They would uh, very quickly uh, lead us. We would be following, trailing behind, and uh, despairing that uh, we can't keep up. But we don't have such a procedure. I was asked by staff at Infinite Energy to write a critique of the, uh, of the Google work. And I led with the phrase, God bless Google. Now, I've never said that before. <laughs> never even thought that before. May never say it again unless it happens that we can give Google this procedure and that they, they take the lead in this activity. The four things that I called out as being conspicuously noteworthy with a, with a vision and action. And Google had uh, decided, in its semi-infinite wisdom, that the solution to mankind's future energy problems cannot be found in the renewable energy sources that we are uh, presently building up, you know, windmills, photovoltaics, whatever. Renewables will not solve man's energy problem. What is needed is for a primary energy source that is uh, reliable, safe, cheap. And only two things, in my view, are capable of meeting that criteria. The, Google's vision is a little broader, and in Google's mind, hot fusion, uh, conventional fission and cold fusion might solve that problem. I don't think hot fusion will ever be economic in that uh, scheme. So I see only two ways forward. Either advanced fission systems, fourth generation, <coughs> possibly thorium systems, that can solve the problem. It has some attendant uh, risk. The other thing that can solve the problem is uh, cold fusion. And, and uh, what, what Google did is acted on this vision. They set up a program, put 10 million bucks into it, put a team together, and set out to see if, if uh, cold fusion could actually do the job. And 
question is still open, it's still under investigation. Second thing that Google did was publish in Nature. Now, those of you who remember 1989 will, and, and the, um, the furor that associated with the uh, initial announcement will remember and understand how significant it is to get a publication in Nature of any sort, uh, other than uh, a condemnatory. And um, on the 30th anniversary, more or less, it was really a wonderful achievement. Confirmation um, of the, uh, the loading ratio that um, was, was first uh, noted, and you need a loading ratio, or to achieve at some point a loading ratio of 0.85 in the DPD system. Um, and but the, the thing that I really pointed out was the fact that Google had pulled together a team of young people who had become interested and in, uh, remain interested in pursuing this field. And they, in fact, have possibly saved, saved us from uh, inevitable demise. Um, I have two, two quotes here, both, both quoting me, of course. One by uh, Trevor Dalek, who is one of the young people that I have brought into the field. The younger participants can help make scientific advances, advances by actually doing science that will bring the research into a new light. And, and today I will say, without active youth participation, we will fail to complete Barton Fleischmann's dream mm -hmm. and vision. Nothing I've said today, or ever really, should be taken as indicating that I don't remain strongly persuaded that, um, to shorten this, uh, cold fusion, uh, condensed matter nuclear effects do occur more or less for the reasons that Julian Schrenger pointed out in 1991. Unlike the near vacuum of hot fusion, the ambient environment of cold fusion is the lattice, which is a dynamical system capable of storing and exchanging energy. That, the, 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 what Stan and Martin discovered was not cold fusion or, or uh, deuterium to uh, helium-4 electrochemical system. What Martin and Stan discovered was vastly bigger than even they imagined. They discovered condensed matter nuclear effects. <coughs> I'm going to skip this in, in the interests of the time and I basically said what is on this uh, slide. What does my mirror look like? Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to cut through this too because my uh, chairman is chastising me. But um, we had three episodes of highly repeatable uh, excess heat production. You know, a Fleischmann Pons experiment, a, a series of experiments that were run, uh, statistically significant excess heat in every one of these experiments. We thought we had the problem solved. This was back in 1990. Cool, we've got it, we understand it, we know it. The material that we were using ran out, the effect went away and then went away for a long time. Um, could I do this uh, again? No. I couldn't do it again, I, I'm too old. You know, I, I'm not willing to put the time in, I don't have the, the, the focus, I, but more importantly, I don't have the team of, of really quite brilliant people around me that uh, is needed to, to run an experiment as difficult as this. I have, I have, a, I have a list of people uh, listed here. Every one of these people has contributed hugely to the success of our undertaking. And not only was I lucky to be in the right place at the right time with the right training and the right resources available, and all of these great people around me, we were lucky. Bottom line, we don't quite know how it works. And Bill was asking, well, you know, what it is if we don't even know what the fuel is or haven't observed the fuel and the uh, consumption of fuel. We don't quite know what it is. 
or how it works, but we know it can be done. And it's already given indications that it might be useful. Our people have uh, energy gains of, you know, 25. Uh, heat produced at uh, 100 degree temperatures or more, where it really is uh, useful. So we suspect, we know the effect is real, we know the effect is nuclear, we know uh, or, or suspect that it might have some practical value. And as I've said many times before, if we can tap the power of the nucleus safely, cheaply, reliable in a tabletop device, we can wield the power of nuclear physics on a tabletop, it must be good for something. <laughs> Conclusion, we get to look in the mirror and learn from what, learn from the way that others view us. But the uh, words in bold are really uh, the cornerstone of this presentation. Given what we know now, what do we do next? What strategies move us forwards? <coughs> this slide, you know, partly in, in uh, commemoration of my very good friend Mike Miller, who passed recently, but I, Mike's loss is huge because Mike was one of the very few people in the community who thought in a strategic way. The other person who's cheerful face you see up there is Matt so Trevithic, who also thinks in a cheerful way and in a strategic way too. Uh, he's down the front, uh, come and you know, beat him up uh, afterwards and better still, offer him uh, tangible strategies to move this field forward. With that, I thank you. Bob Green, you're a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Oh, I don't even need it. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, it, it, on strategy, my personal strategy over the last eight months is to use what condensed matter nuclear effects appear to do, and that's not produce radiation, to recognize that fission is something that's going to be doubled in capacity uh, between now and 2040. This is a reality. And can we use the work of, for instance, Alakorlanova and Vladimir Vysotsky in uh, mitigating the use of fusion, and also Dr. Roy Shinomaza, who have just come back from Japan, who it appears to, uh, to uh, remediate nuclear waste both in liquid form and solid form from fission reactors. Uh, these technologies are where we can have a strategy to use what Lena can do, which may or may not produce excess heat, to enable what we do know produces excess heat. That's my point. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. You wanted a strategy? There's one. I have maybe two comments, more comments than questions. Uh, first one about um, experimental replication or replicable experiments. Uh, in the last uh, eight years, I have been uh, deeply involved in battery research. And uh, I can guarantee you that if you look at scientific literature and take interesting battery inventions uh, and try to replicate them, you will come to a conclusion that batteries don't work. <laughs> <laughs> like this is contrary to everyday experiments. Experience. So it means that somebody has to take the effort from all the reports to select those which, which are applicable and work. And um, we have a lot of uh, publications in the last 30 years, so just somebody has to uh, go through them and, and do the selection. But that's the question who and why would, would fund an activity. So I would uh, pose that question to Google why they don't uh, try to do that. Uh, then, Why did they try to do what? Uh, to just, just go through all the reports and try to select what's replicable, what, what were... Oh, well, I just said that nothing is replicable. Uh, <laughs> well, that would be too sad. I mean, there are some exceptions. That would be too uh, sad for true. But in any case, whether replicable or not, what I'm asking for is a written procedure. I want a piece of paper, you can have two pages if you like, put down a procedure. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this in this environment, and this is what you will see. 
and I'm going to let you only succeed one out of two times. You know, I'll give you 50% failure rate. Last, last question, Chelani. Done. Uh, <laughs> get gas, get, get a sample, put uh, gas on sample, test sample. Opinion, tell me about your claim that they have no experiment at high temperature. Maybe you just forgot our efforts, and now we are working uh, routinely at the temperature over 10,500 degrees. Now we, we reach about 800 in the core of the reactor, outside about 300. So I think at this point it has to be what? Oh, I, 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 what I said was that I, the, the, the chastisement was to me. I didn't run experiments at 300 degrees. I ran my experiments at low temperatures. I am well aware of other people working at higher temperatures, yes, and including your work. Ask a short uh, question, Rubin. Rubin? Yes. When we talk to people and tell them about cold fusion and try to communicate, and um, for instance, university professors, and they say, um, well, uh, I got my nature, and um, nature was pretty clear. Uh, on this doesn't work. What do I say? How can I respond to that? What is the explanation for this? Well, a person that makes that statement is not worthy of communication. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not at all what the nature conclusion was. The nature conclusion was quite neutral and it was very clear from what was said by and about the team that they intend to proceed. If, the, if they believed that they had demonstrated that the effect was not real, they would simply you know, you know, washed their hands and gone on to other things. And I think to a man, you can ask Matt about this, to a, to a man and woman, they all intend to proceed because they are excited with what they have seen. Have they, have they solved the problem with a, a $10 million in four years of effort? Hell no. We didn't solve the problem with 10 times that amount of money and 30 years worth of work, but that doesn't mean there isn't an effect. So uh, I, I think what you're listening to is knee-jerk 1989 Luddite thinking, right? And it's people like that, like people wearing their baseball caps backwards, you know, I, I love that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.